There's much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Joining us from Beijing is journalist and author Roseanne Lake. Her new book is called Leftover in China, The Women Shaping the World's Next Superpower. With us from San Francisco is Ray Ma, an entrepreneur and innovator. She serves as an advisor and contributor to Pandaily.com, a website focused on China's technology industry. Peggy Liu heads the joint U.S.-China collaboration on clean energy. She joins us from Shanghai. And also with us is the United Nations Women Country Program Manager in China, Julie Brossard. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Julie, let me start with you. China has a very high percentage of women in business, and more than 50% of senior management positions are held by women in China. So if we look at this uh, phenomenon, if I could put it that way, in China, what explains that? What is, what is China doing that is so unique or special? I think one factor is education. Uh, China has basically achieved gender parity in education. And in fact, now there are slightly more women than men in university level. And they're getting a very strong education, particularly in uh, math. And I think that's been very empowering for women and helped them to get into uh, the types of careers that we see them moving into. However, I do want to challenge the assumption that it's 50% of women in leadership positions because the statistics we have indicate that it's not quite that high. Uh, according to the gender gap report by the World Economic Forum, board members of publicly traded private sector firms in China are only 9.8% women. So there's still a bit of a leadership gap for women in the business world here. Right, those figures I got from Fortune magazine, and I should say that they are two years old, so uh, that could have changed. Roseanne, let me go to you. You've written a book. It's called Leftover in China, The Women Shaping the World's Next Superpower. Let me ask you first, Leftover in China, uh, why that title? <laughs> well, the title is Leftover in China because there are a lot of leftover women in China. Um, and for those of uh, you know those watching who haven't heard the term, uh, leftover woman is a direct translation from shengnu, the word, the Chinese term used to describe any woman in China over the age of 25 or 27 or 30, depending on who's counting, who has transgressed her societally imposed sell-by date, after which it is assumed that she should be married. So these women are known as leftover women, and, and I argue that actually, you know, contrary to the rather unsavory implications of their term, um, you know, that women in China are not immediately getting married, not having children, because marriage has become discretionary as a result of the reasons that, you know, partly in the, in, as a result of the reasons that Julie just mentioned, they're becoming incredibly well educated and just mapping out different timelines for their young adult years. Um, they are becoming, by societal standards, leftover, and yet, you know, because they are educated and because they're professionally ambitious, I argue in the book that they are an important part of, you know, shaping uh, China's economic future and demographic as well. Right. As, you know, they are and still responsible for having children. Now that we've got that sorted, us, sorted out, um, you know, we've seen China over the last three or four decades, even up to five decades, uh, enormous growth in China, uh, double-digit growth, many years. Uh, what kind of role have women had in this development in China? Yes, well, absolutely. I mean, in the 80s and the 90s, we saw that women played an important part of China being the manufacturing capital of the world, right? We all know the Made in China label because that's an incredible story of men and women working in factories. But it's critical to understand that women were an important part of that, right? They were assembling iPads, Nike sneakers, all of those things. They were part of China's economic transition. And now, as Ch China transitions away from being a manufacturing-based society and, and is, is more keen to become a more knowledge-based society, a different talent pool, obviously, is required to make that transition. As, you know, labor costs go up in China and it's more enticing for companies to maybe manufacture in Thailand or Vietnam, um, China's looking at a different kind of economy. And this pool of educated women that it has will be critical um, in, in helping it make that transition, right? Because this is the type of talent that you need going forward. Um, and they've managed to do this quite successfully here in ways that other East Asian tiger economies like Japan, like South Korea, like Singapore haven't managed to do, right? Like China, they had periods of incredible economic growth. They haven't been able to sustain this economic growth in part because they haven't figured out how to leverage uh, women in the formal economy as successfully as China has. And so although marriage patterns may m mimic those in other East Asian tiger economies, so we'll see more and more Chinese women get married later, if not at all. Right. I don't think the economy will slow down just as much 
because of this difference. Okay, let's go to Ray in San Francisco. And Ray, I just want to pick up on something that Roseanne just talked about there, and that is the social impact that uh, the enormous success that women in China are having in the country. Uh, has it changed their family roles in any significant way? As Roseanne said, they're marrying later, they're deciding not to have children in some instances. Uh, what kind of impact has it had? Yeah, I mean, I read Roseanne's book and I lived in China for uh, eight years and I am part of the demographic that Roseanne uh, has written about. So I do see that um, it has definitely had a social impact. Um, however, I would like still to say that as my uh, role as an investor and entrepreneur, uh, especially in this cross-border U.S.-China arena, I find that uh, many of the uh, female entrepreneurs and investors um, I work with or have invested in uh, do have families. So it, it's not necessarily a prerequisite that for um, some of these women to be successful in business that they do have to postpone. Um, you know, their family plans. That being said, uh, surveys do show that, at least in the case of Chinese women, the, the ability to balance a, you know, business as well as their family life is their primary concern um, and how to balance that level of childcare. One of the things that I think is maybe a little bit different in China is uh, versus the U.S. is that uh, having a, you know, having grandparents and having more caretakers, professional caretakers available to help out with child rearing has actually been very helpful um, for Chinese women who do have families uh, to pursue their entrepreneurial dreams. Peggy, uh, we see Chinese women having more success in business, but have you also seen that there's gender equality when it comes to things like salaries and other benefits in the workplace? Oh my. Well, I think that the, from what I've seen, and again, narrow scope, but I think that there's a good equality in terms of compared to, let's say, the U.S. for Chinese women. And, and just to add on to what Ray just said about you know, the ability for Chinese women to partake in the workplace, I am a mother of two children, um, two boys, 13 and 15. And when I was just having kids in about 2002, 2000 and in China, I was able to hire two caretakers who lived in my house with me, plus a half-time housekeeper, plus a full-time driver for half the cost of what a nanny would cost in California. And so not only is it benefiting women to stay in the workplace, be single for longer, have uh, more ability to pay for caretakers, but the low cost of the professional caretakers has really allowed us to go into the workplace and lean in, so to speak, uh, as well as socialize at night, which I think is very important. So I think there's a lot of factors going on in China that allow us to be executives uh, in a much more, you know, a th uh, I guess, full force way than, let's say, in the U.S. Julie, the Huran Research Group in China released a report that showed that 49 Chinese women are on the global list of self-made billionaires. That is 63% of the total worldwide. Uh, what, what is the difference in China or in the Chinese business environment that gives us such impressive figures? I, I think the high number of women self-made billionaires is a function of, of China's development and the opportunities that have arisen here because of the strong economic growth and the opening up of so many new sectors uh, for, for savvy entrepreneurs to take advantage of. I would like to point out that according to jianmian.com, they, they published a list of China's 1,000 most wealthy people. And of those 1,000 people, only 59 are women. And so that's only 5.9% of Chinese billionaires are women. So that actually points out that there still are a lot of gender gaps here. Uh, and men have been better poised to take advantage of some of the entrepreneurial opportunities. And it's not just a full rosy picture for, for women here. Roseanne, what is your view on that gender gap that Julie's been talking about? Uh, it, it certainly exists. I mean, while it's a wonderful superlative for China to have that it's, you know, home to the world's highest percentage of female billionaires, it is true. I mean, as Julie points out, as, as a percentage of, of the actual total number of billionaires in China, they still represent a small percentage. Um, 
I am hopeful that that, that will change. Um, I think, you know, part of, of what we see in China also playing out, you know, the, the female billionaires who exist, um, who are maybe in their 40s and their 50s, sort of grew up during the Cultural Revolution. It was a different time, and there were different opportunities that came as a result of, you know, the, the opening up and the economic reforms. What we start to see now in China as well, you know, part of why women have gotten so much access to um, higher education is, is in part, in a small way, due to the fact that, you know, China is also seeing its first generations of only daughters, right? These are, you know, women who are were grew up during the peak years of the one-child policy, and they were born in families where, you know, parents instead of of you know choosing to have a son accepted having a daughter, and the fact that they didn't have brothers meant that you know parents poured resources into them. That meant pushing them to study and achieve. It meant, you know, if parents could afford it, sending them abroad to be educated. And it also means, in some cases, you know, saddling them with property if, if the family owns property, but also a family business. So as more of that wealth starts to transfer and more of, you know, these women who have had these, you know, sterling educations um, enter into the business world, hopefully that'll move the needle a little bit and we'll start to see more and more women accumulating wealth because, you know, as as Rain Peggy pointed out earlier, there are conditions here for married and unmarried women in China that, that do make it a little bit easier to become a full force CEO and, and others that make it more difficult. I mean, gender discrimination and things that we see everywhere. Um, but China does have some unique characteristics that, you know, do help out in that regard. Okay, we are going to have to take a break right now. More of our conversation when we return. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat.